Guys, it was truly a pleasure. I sat down with Mr. Wade Sapp at the Sound Emporium Studios in Nashville. And uh, Florida native, it was cool to hear his story. Um, he had a few career stops um, along the way to Nashville, you know, and all the things that come up, the things that we talk about on this show, the overcoming adversity, overcoming the challenges, surrounding yourself with the right people. And he mentions um, some of those people that have been influential to him, you know, in his journey. So y'all check out this episode. I hope you enjoy it. And until next time, stay grateful. Converse Cowboy Journey has given me an opportunity to sit down with some amazing performers that are living the Western lifestyle. Or it is my job to tease out their habits and routines so that you can apply and test yourself in your own life. I've learned, I've grown personally, I've been enlightened, and I've been humbled. Above all, I realize that there is no destination in this life, no goal achieved or money made that can replace the feeling of flow and the pursuit of doing what you love to do. With a growth mindset, I'm constantly asking questions and pursuing knowledge. The Converse Cowboy is a platform that allows me to do just that. I'm excited and eager to share their stories with you all. I'm Mike Roberts, and this is The Converse Cowboy. Brought to you by Kerry Kelly Bits and Spurs and Schaefer Outfitter. So yeah, we'll talk about it, man. How's life treating you today in Nashville, Tennessee? Man, life's pretty good. Can't complain. Uh, that's what everybody says anyway, but we can all complain. Um, <laughs> yeah, right. I, I've got a good garden this year, which is nice. Uh, COVID kind of allowed me to, it was a paranoid purchase really. So I just went and, went and bought like a ton of seeds because they travel really easily. Uh -huh. And I thought the world was might might end, but you could have been. have some food on reserve? Yeah. Uh, so I've got a great garden, been writing a lot, uh, just cooped up in the house still. Um, yeah. In between waiting for tours and shows to come back, full swing for me, a guy who's starting out. Um, I'm also doing a lot of odd jobs of all kinds. I built a chicken coop for Bill Cody's daughter, uh, the WSM host, you know. And, yeah. uh, man, I've done all kinds of jobs. I'm also a mechanic by trade is how I started into the, the work field and yeah. workforce, rather. But, yeah, so I've just been doing a lot of random, you know, labor and writing songs. Right on. Yeah, I read somewhere you started a uh, pressure washing business. And That's right. Doing some, some construction work or yep. maybe some renovation type all, stuff. All of it, man. Basically, people just text me or call me and I'll say, yes, I can. No, I can't. You know, Yeah. based on shows and whatnot. I definitely want to get into that, you know, life as a musician in Nashville and, and you know, the hustle and grind of, of what that takes. I want to save that, though. Um, and, and right now, like, go back. So you're born in Okeechobee, Florida. Uh, correct. Well, Pahokee is where babies are born and that are from Okeechobee because they don't deliver babies at the Okeechobee Hospital. You have okay. to drive around the lake and go over to Pahokee. But, Fair enough. Uh, same hospital Mel Tillis was born in. It's kind of cool. There you go. But that's my country music cred. And <laughs> that's about it. <laughs> right on. So so you're, you're there and then you attend the NASCAR Technical Institute, right? That's so right. Was that the dream, like going through your childhood and through high school like that's what you wanted to do well i wanted to be like one of three things i thought okay I'll, i'm gonna be a baptist preacher for sure then that didn't work out and then i was like well i want to be a nascar driver and, and get into that racing field and i got into that went to the school uh kind of worked on an arca team and just kind of got a feel for it and i realized I was, it's got really a lot like the music industry i didn't know this at the time but I just was like, you got to work for free. You got to be in this garage till three in the morning. I got to be up for school at six, you know, like, yeah, ain't happening, you know. And so I, it wasn't my passion. That's just the truth exactly. of it. So I kind of like took the safe route and finished that school, moved back to Atlanta area uh, where I was basically, I grew up. We When I was about eight years old, we moved to Atlanta and that's where I went to school. But moved back there, had a girlfriend back there. And so, of course, that pulled me back. And anyway, I Worked on cars for BMW for about three years, switched over to Infinity, and then I left the world of cars and started playing in bars. So like, how many, how many, because I think that's so important because it's a lot of what this show is about, like finding your purpose. There's so many totally. young folks out there, fuck man, there's still so many 40 and 50 year olds still out there looking for their purpose. Mm -hmm. And to try to find that or, or be told that you need to know what your major in college is going to be when you're 17, 18 years old. Yeah. It's a tall ask. It I mean, sure it's is. It's a lot to ask. And so, so you think you want to do this NASCAR thing. How many years did you spend doing that before you were like, nah, this, this really isn't Actual NASCAR? 
Um, in that world, I did it for about a little over a year, and yeah. that's how it didn't take me long. I was just like, eh, I'm moving out of here. This is it's not my world. Yeah. I, I still love racing and motorsports in general. I just went to the indie race here in Nashville, right. but anyway, um, I spent maybe seven years total uh, okay. working on cars uh, in general, and that you know transitioned from NASCAR and then went into I just need to work so I can afford to pay bills and stuff. So I got a job at a dealership. Right. Just working on passenger vehicles. Were you playing the guitar at the time? Had you picked that up yet? Okay. Um, my I was 14 when I got my first guitar. Um, my mom had a boyfriend that was big into rock and roll and played a Dean guitar and lived in a houseboat that was filled with Kiss action figures and, and crap and swag. Uh, so that's another story. Uh, but anyway, he took me to my first concert and kind of inspired me, uh, which was Kiss, of course, right and uh, inspired me to pick up a guitar. And so I started playing a guitar. And yes, it, it, I basically just kind of played around campfires and was very, very shy. I'm a shy person by nature. And uh, it took me forever before I'd even sing in front of another person uh, or even play a guitar in front of an, another right. person. But anyway, yeah. That's so family. No family was music. Nobody. Musical. No, my papa plays. That's my grand, my mom's dad. Uh, he uh, plays harmonica on the porch sometimes. But um, he and he actually will write songs and he sings them and they're kind of more recitations. But he'll just kind of come up with rhyming sentences and they're usually telling a story about Seminole Indians or who knows what uh, down in awesome. Florida and that kind of that Florida. They call it Florida Cracker lifestyle, <laughs> which is um, you know the cowboys down there. Yeah. Sweet. So, you start playing the guitar. You go to some open mic nights. The, you know, and tell me if I get any of this wrong. Um, this is just based on what I read. But so you start playing some open mic nights, playing sad country songs, overcoming mm -hmm. a, I guess, a recent breakup at right. the time. And then wherever you were playing at, uh, introduced a new rule like you couldn't play cover songs anymore. ASCAP, uh, you know, performing rights organization. They just kind of cracked down on this open mic night where people were playing you know brown eyed girl to whatever you know and um i think i played like a jack johnson song with one of my buddies around that college age and uh some other song uh the week before and we came back just to kind of like hey we're, that was kind of fun we enjoyed it. it was a coffee shop you know we weren't yeah. getting drunk or anything and uh they had that rule it's like you no know, originals only and i was like man i only know one original you know <laughs> um and my buddy didn't practice with me and he was just playing a djembe you know just slapping the hand drum like a couple of hippies but uh so i played it and it's a song called lonesome road and it's very much it's like three quarter time like slow sad country um but the crowd just kind of shut up the whole time like it was loud coffee shop then it got quiet and that was surreal to me for one uh and it just uh kind of fueled the fire it yeah. was all it took and i went home and it's like well if i want to do this again i need to start writing more songs and so i did how old were you then uh, probably 22, 23, somewhere in there. Okay. So were you writing before then? Like, I know you had the one song, but were right. you writing uh, While I was going to NASCAR Tech, I wrote that Lonesome Road song. Okay. And I was just kind of like, kinda you know. venting out your emotions? Yeah, it was from... the second time I'd left home, but um, I was like 19 and uh, just felt totally far and distant from everybody we were we were a very close family i was raised by a single mother with mm -hmm. you know five kids so we were she always made sure to keep us as like a unit and so it was my first time out there being lonely and um really lonely and nobody around that i knew and it just kind of made me write a song about it i don't know where it came from and it re really it sounds like something out of like like a merle haggard b cut or something like that it's just kind of slow rolling country and Anyway, it, it just, I had no idea what I had just done when I did it. <laughs> you didn't know what that was going to lead yeah. to? Not even it's an interesting inkling. interesting how that plays out, right? Yeah. How certain things happen and, and change our path or our direction. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it might, I might as well have gotten struck by lightning, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> so you start playing a circuit through North Georgia at that time, right? Right. So I learned, okay, there are other open mic nights, not just one. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are bars that will actually pay you to play and it was my mom's boyfriend's band that I opened for at Lakeside Grill or no sorry Little River Grill take that back in um, Ackworth Georgia and they were like hey we'll pay you a hundred bucks come play for 45 minutes I was like no shit for real you're gonna give me money to do this all right cool yeah. 
And uh, I'm still getting paid the same, you know, today, you know. <laughs> but uh, anyway, it, it, I, I played and people, I had a bunch of friends come. They couldn't believe I had the balls to do it. And it was just like, who is this guy? Because in high school, I had like four friends, maybe. And that's that's good, I know. I still talk to those people, but um, I just was a little more of a loner, kind of quiet dude and shy. And, and to, for me to be on stage was really blowing their minds. So they showed up in full force. And right so that was like my first crowd experience, you know, of yeah. like, people that were into it and I was pay- playing all covers I didn't even play that Lonesome Road song it was just kind of a my first gig right on yeah so from there getting to Nashville what does that transition look like um a lot of different uh relationships um trying different things uh but I mean m- mainly just being un- uh, unsatisfied that was my big problem I couldn't find the same joy out of regular life of go to work on cars, come home, drink yourself to sleep. That was not very fun. I don't know why. Um, but yeah, it, uh, man, I just, I, was, uh, I wasn't satisfied. I wasn't where I was supposed to be. I wasn't following the path. I was trying to steer to the side of it and, you know, take it where I was supposed to go. You know? Right, right, so, right, right. So you could feel like something wasn't right. but Oh, like, yeah. I mean, it was like a... I used to tell people have the headless, like dark, kind of feeling inside of me that was just eating away at me, and yeah. And since I kind of dove off into this and took control of my schedule, and yeah. I wasn't just under the thumb of someone else uh, working, man, it just kind of like gave me the 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 life, you know, that we all look for uh, yeah. and we're all searching for. Yeah. I was victim of the same thing, man, going down this track of what I thought I was supposed to do, and mm-hmm. I had the feeling, but I just ignored it. I didn't know that you could acknowledge it. I didn't know that there was a, another route. You know, it's almost like a blind persistence. Totally. Um, okay, so you, you, you moved to Nashville in 2016. You, it's like imprinted in you, like, this is what you're going to do. You're going to be a singer-songwriter. Yeah. Like, At that point, I was I was determined uh, that... that that is my path. Yeah, so what was that, five years ago? Yeah, flies. Yeah, um, so when you get to Nashville, what does that look like? Because I know there's a lot of young singer-songwriters out there with that on their mind, thinking about making that move, and then to actually do it, like, what is what was that experience like? Um, it was a lot of things. I mean, it's kind of like strapping yourself into a roller coaster for the very first time is really what it felt like, because it becomes that really fast, and you have no idea what's around the next bend, it might make you throw up. It might make you <laughs> scream for joy. You know, it's very intense. Uh, but I, if anybody is considering doing it, they should have been here when they first thought about doing it because I wasted about 10 years of my life not being here. Wanting to do it or thinking about it? And- Want, thinking about it. I, I would say I was I was like 17 years old when I first decided. I was like, man, I, I kind of want to be a country singer. That sounds pretty fun. But mm-hmm. I had barely a voice. I was only doing karaoke at the lake and stuff and um that's how i knew what to play when i was opening for that band was just like doing all the karaoke (laughs) songs but um anyway uh yeah man it just uh nashville when i'm the the day i moved here my mom had a stroke that tells you how much she was worried about me but uh and i i shouldn't carry that weight but that happened and she was a minor stroke she's able to walk she works talks Mm -hmm. all that stuff but it you know it was intense and so that was my first night in Nashville. And I was like, well, all right, that happened. And I kind of drove around the city. And I, I do a lot of that sitting and like looking at something and uh, at a transcendental meditation or whatever you do want to call it. And I would just drive around the city and kind of like eyeball the skyline and like, that's all you got, mofo? You're like, come on. Mama, you, can't, you can't take my mama. Like, and I just kind of like put out like a vendetta almost for the city like i'm gonna conquer this shit you mm-hmm. know good for because you. of that so it anyway moving to nashville was intense i'll say that yeah, right and, out of the gate yeah right out of the gate and uh i moved in with a buddy of mine john latham he's a killer songwriter kind of more in the uh rock and roll um like a la jason isbel world and he lived here had a house and it was a dump. We all lived there. It was me and uh, another songwriter named Nick Nace and John Latham. And it was like 340 bucks a month or something like that for the rent. You know, it was a, a dump. Uh, you but split 340 or that was your part? That was my part. But uh, 
plus utilities. But anyway, it did was, you know those guys before you got here? I did. Yeah, okay. I knew one of them uh, from a songwriter festival in Mississippi I played, and the other one I knew uh, from those open mics back in Georgia. That, okay. That's John Latham. And gotcha. Um, about six months in, um, amid all the other BS of moving here and trying to find your way when you're poor, and uh, man, it just uh, it. The rug, got, the rug got pulled out from under us because the guy was like, hey, I'm going to, you know, renovate the place and sell it. So you guys got to be out by the end of the month. And we're like, we have two weeks. Mm. Thanks, man. Uh, so that happened. And, man, I moved five times in one year here. Were you playing gigs? Like, did the gigs start coming immediately when you got here? So my second night in town, I went to Santa's Pub. And I heard that they had, like, a kind of country band thing going on there well that i found out that was only on sunday nights and so i went and that kind of became my uh, little river grill of okay. nashville it was kind of like all right let me just immerse myself in this scene i got a tip from a buddy in atlanta that told me about santa's and it was a lot of like the luke bells and um christina murray and all of these kind of up and coming kind of old school vibe country artists they would hang out there so then I found out about the American Legion in East Nashville, and I found out about all the places, including over here, you know, off 16th and Division, and, you know, just checking out all the Midtown bars where all the songwriters and modern, you know, business stuff happens. Yeah. And so I've kind of, the whole time I've been here, I've ignored the river is what I say. I just ride that fence, baby. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, you guys can't pull me in either direction. I'm going to be friends with everybody. So yeah, despite the whole vendetta I put out for the city, I do love living here. Right on. Anyway, right long-winded on. story. But. No, it's all good. Um, and I think that's so important, like the people that we surround ourselves with. We were talking a little bit about that um, before we got started. And I saw, I know you and Elizabeth Cook are pretty tight. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had the pleasure of interviewing her, I don't know, a few months ago. She and, told me uh, to tell you hello. Oh, right on. And thanks for Joe's Crab Shack. <laughs> yeah, so I asked her a, a side note here. I don't know if she told you the story, but I asked her like at the end of the show, what's a question that you've never been asked, but you wish that somebody would ask you? Mm -hmm. And she sat there for a minute, and she's like, I, she's like, I'd love somebody to ask me, can I send you some crab legs? <laughs> <laughs> and so I tried Sounds to do about right. I tried to do that, and uh, you can't send crab legs to a P.O. box. So I was like, what's the next best thing? I was like, oh, that'll be funny. I'll send her a Joe's Crab Shack gift card. So it's awesome. But yeah, she's a sweet soul and, and doing the damn thing, you know? And, totally. Um, she's got to be the hardest working person I've ever met. I mean, I'm not kidding, man. It's, really? Very, uh, she diversifies and just stays buried in it. It never stops. It's but, in her blood, it seems like, just from the little bit I learned from her during that interview. Yeah, totally. She's kind of in her. 100%. But I saw a quote on your Instagram. You said, if I hadn't met Elizabeth Cook, there's a good chance I'd either be dead or in jail again. That's true. Um, I got, you know, a little bit uh, strung out, is one way to put it, but it, it wasn't on it, you know, I wasn't doing heroin. I was just... Um, driving around this town and trying to hustle and uh, spending every mo bit of money I made at a Western store on Broadway. Uh, I, I worked there for like three and a half years just as a life support job uh, in between shows and whatever. But I was just riding all the way to the curb. Um, and she was a constant kind of like beacon of hope for me, like in the, the whirlwind and darkness of it all. Uh, but I, I mean, I lived in my van for like six months here. And um, even with a job, and I was like, man, I'm in America, and this is, this is the way this is. And it, it was all my own doing. I wasn't living properly, but uh, um, I was I'm also trying to. It's kind of like going to college in a way. You move here and you try to like immerse yourself in it all and learn. And anyway, if I hadn't met Elizabeth, uh, it would have been probably either go back home, you know, find something else to do, or yeah. uh, uh, go to jail. And I, I got a DUI, like three years ago almost and it was a bad one and that i quit drinking and you know it was like all thanks to elizabeth she kind of gave me like a safe haven mm -hmm. to uh reside in how did y'all cross paths uh we played a tribute show to lucinda and um lucinda williams and steve earl and we really? kind of did like car wheels on a gravel road and copperhead road um it was like a, a mash of those two records at the basement east right on and um she was on it and that was uh, my first big i guess gig in town and it was maybe three or four months after living here and so anyhow i had met her uh at a bar 
at D's Country Cocktail Lounge about three days before the gig. And I said, hey, I'm Wade Sapp. I'm from Okeechobee. And I know you're from Wildwood and I'm a big fan, blah, blah, blah. But we're playing on the show together. And that, then um, she was like, cool, I don't go away, you know. But uh, <laughs> no, no, not really. She was like, Okeechobee, cool, whatever. So uh, we reconnected at the show and we just became really fast friends. I've done work for her, all kinds of stuff. She sang on my record, you know. I, I saw that. Yeah. 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 Tell me about that, because I'm naive to Nashville. I'm naive to this singer-songwriter world, but, like, so you you moved to Nashville, you're, you're an up-and-comer. Do those guys like Elizabeth Cook, like the... I know you toured with Culture Wall. Like, do they take you under their wing once they see you out? Like, immediately, or do they have to see you at a few shows and recognize, okay, this this guy's really hustling? And The latter, I would say. Um, both equally nice people and have been extremely supportive of what I do. Um but yeah, I think it, it was just kind of like you you got to prove yourself. Like with Coulter, I felt like there was like a church bell ringing in the background when I met him because it was on Willie's Ranch out in you know, Luck, te- Reunion, Luck, Texas. Right. And uh, I shook his hand and I was like, is there cameras on us or something? It was this weird feeling. And I was like, I'm going to work with this dude for a while. And then, you know, fast forward maybe a year or two later after yeah. that. And uh, his manager hit me up and asked if I could open some shows. What was it about that you think? Like, is it... Is it like those p- certain people you meet, like you just feel that vibe or like yeah. their energy, like there's something special about them? I, I try to be open and perceptive to, of those things because I believe you are on some sort of a path. Um, I believe that free will exists sometimes, but uh, other times I don't because of things like that. And with Coulter, I, I just think that he's uh, he's uh, got a bead on something that uh, is very hard to find. Um, it's so pure. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. It's a kind of a no BS approach yeah. to life and music. Yeah, it's like a present what it is, and if you want to li- if you want to listen, listen, and if you don't, like I'm good with that too. Is what right. it seems like from him. Yeah, but that, that's a good that's that's a good way to look at it for sure. Yeah, you mentioned free will. I don't know where I stand. I, actually, I, I feel like I stand like on both sides of the fence. Like mm-hmm. yes, I do consciously make decisions, but at the same time, I do feel like this path is already paved in a way. Right. If that even makes... I know it's like a contradictory statement, but... I think, for me, it's kind of like we have parameters set within, you know, we have the limitations of our mind or whatever, uh, and we can kind of, you know, weave in those parameters, but you're still kind of like within the bumpers on the, you know, the bowling alley. Yeah, and I think a lot of it stems from our, like, our environment, who we were around or what has conditioned us to think a certain way. Totally. Like you're talking about those parameters, so I'm constantly trying to expand that. Sure. I'm trying to get these bumpers out here. and, and That's the goal. As crazy as it is, I want to hit both sides of it <laughs> so mm-hmm. I know where this center is. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, yeah, like you mentioned earlier, like the constant pursuit. Like I wish I could just be complacent and not try to you know st- you know have to continue searching i wish i could just be complacent and stay at home but uh, that's not how i'm wired <laughs> um yeah same so uh, along those same lines so you have another quote i was listening to an interview um you did and you said uh, referring to like being persistent be a lovable pest mm-hmm. i learned that from a guy named troy martin um he's a songwriter he wrote uh, that george Strait song baby's gotten good at goodbye um sitting on the front steps, staring down the road, whatever. Uh, but he just gave me some, some advice uh, early when I moved here and, and said, just keep on showing up and be lovable. That's it. Just be a lovable pest. And that always stuck with me because I think that's a, a good approach. Now that I've been in this town, you kind of see a lot of the same things start to happen. You New people coming into town and, and people trying to schmooze and what have you. And uh, there's people who are genuine and actually lovable uh and then there are people who are just opportunistic that want to come after you so you i just try not to annoy people but um but and if i do make sure it's something that they're going to remember fondly i guess yeah how do you keep that persistence though way like how do you uh, i don't want to I don't want to say COVID, but COVID is one of those uncontrollables amongst a number of other things I'm sure that have came up along your journey since you've been in Nashville. Like, how do you continue to stay persistent? How do you continue to keep a positive mindset, overcome the negative chatter that we as humans all have? I've just convinced myself that this is what I'm supposed to do. I mean, 
I've tried a lot of stuff. I, I tried the other two things, which was Baptist preacher and NASCAR driver, and they didn't work out. Did so. you really try the Baptist preacher, or was that an idea? Uh, no, I'm dead serious. Uh, really? Yeah, I kind of went to one of those like fire and brimstone, old school like Baptist churches. My mom just shoved me in there because if I didn't, I, there's no telling what would have happened to me. I was pretty rambunctious as a kid, and um, anyhow, uh, I really thought like I, I gave it a, on, on a really honest shot. I read my Bible daily and had devotionals and it was more of that old school kind of approach of uh, just a divine um, intervention or something I, I don't know I, I was you're supposed to be not of this world they say and yeah I really was I was I was working at BMW as a mechanic and I didn't cuss for like two years not I mean I'd, I if I thought of a cuss word I prayed and it was like a very it was a mantra hmm. and a way of life and uh the more I got into it, um, I, I just, it seemed like the more I was getting pulled the other direction. And it's that devil. That's what it was. <laughs> <laughs> it was that damn devil. Satan's got in me. But uh, um, anyway, man, it just, uh, it didn't feel authentic to who I really was. And I felt like a, a lot of distancing between me and my family. I started, that's kind of what happens though, you know, Buddha or what, whoever, you know, you that's kind of, if you want to walk the spiritual path, be it, any religion you've got to go on it your own way mm -hmm. and that's it and i think i've just kind of co-opted that into my country music kind of drive right on how do you continue to find that like what's true to you write better songs so you go to the the writing yeah i think um i've i've kind of got that mindset just like locked in and so it, it frees me to do that but the writing when i write a new song it's like for real the best thing that like when it's a good song anyway right. i still kind of have practice shots you know and i've kind of gotten into the, the co-writing world a little bit with people i enjoy being around and kind of have similar tastes with because mm -hmm. i don't want to steer too far away from what it is that i do um i ever found myself doing what is the the setting and uh, and again listening to another interview you did um it's interesting like you, you'll go to a diner and you talk to the cook and you talk to the locals that come in and <clears throat> yeah listen to their stories but like i want to hear that story and then how does it happen like okay uncover the mystical this you know demystify this thing that it's, a lot of people have questions about i i think um if you want my honest opinion about that uh for me like the diner yes i'll go to very the diner might be the counter at jiffy lube or something you know or Wherever, you know, it's just somebody saying something. It, uh, it's just, I'm always kind of, I've got my antennas up, yeah. li listening and looking for songs. And uh, so I'll just write stuff down and uh, note on my phone sometimes. Um, a lot of my best songs, I just kind of have that spark of inspiration while I'm watching Sopranos or something. I'm like, I got to get up and <laughs> I got to go do that. That's, it, it's real, you know, and you can feel it kind of like a, uh, it's like catching a wave uh -huh. uh, or something. I don't know. Uh, I don't think it's, I don't think there's a single songwriter that's any good that uh, is the sole source of the song, personally. So uh, to kind of move it into that d demystification, I, I can't do that for you because it is, it's mystery to me. Yeah. Um, I can always tell in my songs when I overworked them or uh, underworked them, I should say, <laughs> yeah. Um, I've heard there's a writer uh, by the name of Stephen Pressfield. He wrote yeah. Legend of Bagger Vance. He's written The War of Art, uh, Turning Pro, a number of other bestsellers. But he said the same thing. He's like, I didn't know I was going to write these books about the Roman Empire or whatever it may be. It just mm -hmm. came through him. Yeah. So it's like having that antenna up and being able to tap into the muse <laughs> is what I'm learning, you know? Yeah, and respect it. And um it's kind of like synchronicity or anything that pops up that's kind of like a we don't have any way to prove any of this uh but if you ignore it it will almost in a way it'll give you like another few chances uh in various forms i've had song ideas come at me in different forms and i wish i could give you an example but like i'll ignore the first bell that rings and there's a second and a third and then it's gone and it's like screw you then you know it's kind of like that and then i'll, I'll feel dry for a while and not even know it sometimes. Yeah. It's bizarre, and I know this sounds like hocus pocus, but it's just the way it feels, and it's how I perceive it. So, do you have a theme like when you're, so you're taking these notes? I want to know like first, how do you organize these lyrics? How do you organize your songwriting? 
And then when you do sit down at a, I'm assuming, is it pen and paper? Is it on a computer? I do both. Um, I, after kind of being here for a while and, and kind of seeing the end result of what can happen to a song, like being hung in the Hall of Fame, I prefer to write on paper. It's just nice to see the work and kind of, mm -hmm. oh yeah, that verse was pretty good, but I, I took it out and I, here's why I did it. It's nice to look back and kind of see this, the story of the song. Mm -hmm. um, so I write on paper typically and how it goes from just kind of that random idea from the cafe or what have you. Um, I'll, I'll just sit down, I immediately grab a guitar. A lot of times if I have an idea like uh, Ghostwood, you know, if that came into my, my mind, I would just start thinking about, you know, the paranormal and, you know, nature and kind of set up the scene. And, mm -hmm. and a, lot, a lot of times I try to write a song that's conversational so that it sounds like I'm talking directly to the listener. It's just kind of my natural style, but it, I think it is very effective as well. Mm -hmm. And I'll kind of start with a melody. That usually comes first with the, the title or the idea or whatever. I can kind of know the vibe and what I'm trying to go for. Like if it's a rock song about getting laid or whatever, you're going to write, you know, whatever. But it's just you kind of match the vibe of whatever you're trying to say. And sometimes you don't know what that is until it's written. I got you. It's like abstract painting in a way. Right on. Do you keep yeah. that voice recorder close to you driving down the road? My like phone, you... man. I, yeah, if I lost it, it would suck. But I, <laughs> I try to back it up pretty regularly. Just plug it into my laptop and it dumps it all. How do you stay organized with all of that? How do you keep the notes? Like, are you going back and looking at that? Like, I know when I interviewed Elizabeth, she talked about having, like, filing cabinets of all of oh, these yeah. um, lyrics. I, that I would love to say that I'm that organized, but for me, it's kind of like a big old sifter or something, like a coin sorter. And the best one, the best ideas will, it's like paying for gold. You know, I that's a better you, yeah. uh, thing. I'm like, I just kind of wait and let the best ones sink through and try to wash away all the BS, you know. Right on. A lot of times you got to do a lot of sifting first and then the idea will come. Yeah. I think the muse works that way. It's kind of like, you know, you got to work at this too. It's, it's chop wood, carry water, then enlightenment, you know. Then after that, chop wood, carry water again. Man, I think about that so much and I'd love to hear your perspective on it. Like the finding that balance that works for you, it's different for everybody, but finding the balance between like pushing for more and really working hard and then also like that rest and relaxation slash reflection time mm -hmm. I think both are needed both are necessary yeah what does that look like for you I wish that I took more time to relax it's I kind of come from that old school mentality mm -hmm. you just wake up and bust ass you know and all, until you go to bed and you do it again that's just what you do and yeah. relaxation is not exactly scheduled in well it's viewed as like non-productive because right? right. i'm the same way i came from the fa same background it was like that's viewed as non-productive sure but what i'm learning in recent years is that's actually very productive right it, it feels it, weird it feels it, so weird and it i kind of can look at like sunday as a day of rest there was a reason that was there in in our society at least part of our society mm -hmm. and that was kind of the the excuse for the working class was, hey, we're, it's Sunday. We don't do anything. There aren't any stores open anyway. Just going to hang out here. I mean, I knew families that didn't even cook on Sunday. They cooked Saturday night for Sunday. And they would just, you know, heat it up mm -hmm. just to avoid doing work. It was a, a right. thing. Well, it's kind of like going to the gym, right? Like, you mm -hmm. got to have those rest days. Yeah. You know, that's whenever those muscles are rebuilding. Yep. It's my simplistic way of thinking about it anyway. Yep. And it can be anything from just taking a drive to swimming or fishing or anything. I mean, like that. I can, I try to, like, if I'm getting stuck on a song, I've been with, like, Brent Cobb writing a song before, and we're just like, I don't even smoke cigarettes, but I'll go outside and smoke a cigarette because it's kind of like a fast version of that relax, relaxing kind of step away from it moment. And mm -hmm. um, plus you get that cool Russian nickname, man. <laughs> 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 Are you leaning on any vi vices while you're writing? Sometimes, but not typically. I mean, um, I find that I write a lot of more um, ballads uh, or just slower kind of stuff, and I'm trying not to do that too much because that can make it a little bit tough at a live sh show. Uh -huh. if you don't have enough songs to kind of, you know, change it up, get people's excitement levels up. It can it can be kind of hard. Uh, but that's because of weed, I think. It's just smoking a lot of weed or like waking up and hitting a bowl and then, yeah. you know, I, on a day off and I don't have anything going on or I, whatever. But it can kind of alter my state of mind if I'm kind of feeling a little bit foggy or I haven't been right, doing the work of writing and 
sifting through all that dirt, it can it can kind of like open up the hippies use the side door. You know, it's kind of like in your mind. You can just kind of like do that. So yeah. Anyway, it, that that's probably my only vice that I lean on. Yeah. Currently. Uh, and it it is harmful to my voice. I know it is, and uh, I should do it less. So that's a vice in my definition. Right on. Um, you mentioned co-writing. What are your thoughts on that? Do you prefer to write alone, or are you act, are you do you see benefit in co-writing with other folks? I see benefit. Um, there's plenty of uh, like I'll go down to a writing house on uh, on Music Row, and somebody called me up last minute because of cancellation or it was something I scheduled, whatever. And I'll go into the room to a stranger that I've got to figure out a way to level with. And I come from uh, a little bit different background than a lot of people do and a decent amount of struggle, uh, I think. Um, And sometimes I'll get in a room with somebody who has had zero of that and it makes it hard to level. And so I'll just kind of, we'll, we'll fart out a a song and it looks about like what you'd expect when uh, two totally opposite people get together in a room but how does that work so again like i'm not okay. in nashville so like um, these, i hear about these writer sessions like so you may schedule it but are you scheduling this with somebody you don't know just for the practice of it or uh sometimes uh i'll go to like a writer's round either i'm playing at it or um that's kind of like the um the social uh meetup for a lot of writers is you'll just go see the other writers playing if you're not playing so already this is at a venue at a venue and they're okay. everywhere around the, the this especially this side of town here okay but uh anyhow you'll just kind of like go out to these writers nights you meet people shake hands uh, hey we should write sometime as a joke like they make t-shirts like that say that because it's just <laughs> such a like a, you'll get on somebody's number and you'll never ever text them they won't text you uh but there are people that you'll vibe with and so that's been my experience is I, I like to f- seek out people that I can already vibe with and then go and write with them. Um, there's this young guy coming up named Ben Chapman. Okay. I like a lot, and uh, he's we've written multiple songs already and just a few like meetups. And, and, and you click? Yeah, and we click. And it's just, it, a lot of it has to do with the upbringing. You know, uh, he's from Georgia, small town, and we kind of grew up around the same pe- type of people. So it works, but... So like, where do they take place? Are you meeting up at a studio? Or? Um, well, like with him, like we meet at his house, or um, we've met. He's got a writing room over at RCA that he splits with some people, and we'll go over to the RCA studio. It's like where every record's been made, just about it seems like. But um, it's uh, the house of Dave Cobb now. He's made a ton of like the Stapleton records and all mm-hmm. kinds of stuff over there. But uh, so that can happen in that way. And then there's also, like, I've got a relationship with a publishing house, and they've got writers coming at them all the time, new writers that don't have don't know anybody, and they're like, I need songs for this upcoming project. And so they'll just kind of, like, I have a relationship. I'm not signed. I don't have a publishing deal, but I kind of, like, skate around to these different houses, and I'm, I'm kind of like a freelance, you know. I kind of don't want a publishing deal in a way, and I'll get to that. But um, I'll just go to this... A person and say hey I'm I need, I need rights and or they'll just hit me up and say hey I got this person I'm, I want you to write with and mm-hmm. so they'll set up the appointment and I share my calendar with them like Google Calendar and it's like a job you just go and you meet this person in a room like we we're sitting here and there's just guitars or piano or something and we'll talk about our lives and you just have to be very open with each other and that's kind of the the fear of it all is like the there's some things I, I, yeah the vulnerab- vulnerability of it all and um, I can tend to like want to live very privately mm-hmm. as far as my private life is concerned and so it can get a little strange for me but that's how it works you basically just kind of meet people that either are song pluggers or work for a publishing house and they'll just kind of start to set you in and if you start to get you know songs that come through and they're like that's a dynamite song we got to record that yeah uh, or send it to Alan Jackson or whoever, you know, and they'll just kind of, they've got whole office buildings full. And I say office buildings, they're like houses converted into offices, but, uh, and then they, they pitch songs to artists. Right on. Man, I nerd out on that stuff. That's so interesting. Yeah. And so are you like, um, you write a version of the song, they write a version of the song. Are you like writing line for line? It, it kind of changes up. I mean, it, a lot of it, like, uh, I'll just come in with say say I had the the idea like we'll, we'll just kind of start sit down here's an idea I've got you like it no okay what do you got and then we'll just kind of go back and forth playing ping pong in a way and mm-hmm. then I I kind of heard that idea like this first and so you'll kind of 
go down that road, see if it goes anywhere. It's kind of like just taking a hike or something and bushwhacking, you know, you're just kind of like going through there and trying to find the, the path find to the, the end. Path, yeah. yeah. And uh, it, it's kind of like there's no rhyme or reason. You might come up with a whole chorus or show up with a whole chorus and say, hey, I want, I want to work on this today. I'm stuck on it. Mm. I, haven't, I don't know where it's going. And if you open yourself up, sometimes you can come up with some really good stuff. Other times it'll just be a song that'll never get heard, you know? Right. Right on. That, that, uh, that question comes up a lot. I think about guys like the Guy Clarks. Like you, you said, it may be something that never gets heard. Like how many songs are in those notebooks that he wrote down oh, that man. nobody's ever heard of? You the know? thousands, I would think. I mean, he was a master of the craft and yeah. loved to meet new writers, loved mm -hmm. to write all the time. Um, did you ever get to meet him or write? With I never him? did. Um, he's a huge uh, influence on me. Um, if not for my friend John Latham, I mentioned I would. It would have taken me a lot longer to find out who Guy, Guy Clark is or was. Um, actually, I'm going Thursday to go see his new documentary or the one about him. I should say. Uh, uh, what's the name of it, Wade? Uh, without getting killed or without caught. Without getting killed or caught. Yeah, it's from LA Freeway. Yeah. But, um, I read the book back when it came out and. Um, I'm trying to remember the lady's name who wrote it. It's Tamara something, Saviano or something like I that. I read it too, and I can't... Yeah, it's it's excellent, but um, he's an interesting cat. And I yeah. I love his um, work ethic of it all and his diligence and just... I mean, he stuck with it and was very hard-nosed. I try not to be too curmudgeon-y or get jaded or... I mean, this industry has a way of doing that to people, and um, I, I don't think I'll ever lose like you're a country singer you know thing uh but it does i go through seasons of just like man why are people like this <laughs> you know why why is it this way why it's, it could be so much easier but and, and what do you mean by that oh gosh um just the uh, there, uh, there's a lot of things that are different about th this industry i found that with uh with the music industry it's hard to be direct with people sometimes um it, it feels like you got to sugarcoat it and it might just be that we're all from the bible belt and that's the way things are done around here and yeah uh but man i'm just i, I try to, to shoot it straight and sometimes i some people think i'm an asshole man and i'm really not trying to be one that's yeah. like my goal in life is to be perceived in like a good way and everybody likes me and right. whatever but um I can just be kind of straight up with people and it freaks some people out or somebody will say hey do you want to go do this and i'll just say no yeah i'm not oh well i got this thing and uh, you know maybe sometime it's just man just say i'm it with straight. you it's like setting those boundaries and 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 yeah saying no because i'm from the south as well and came up the same way so that's a good question and then i like to ask how do you determine what to say yes to how do you determine what to say no to schedule's the first one but uh you know it i, I try to make sure it's like I got, I had a, a project that I was a part of. I won't name names, and it was with this guy, and we wrote a song together that wasn't great. It was okay, and it had a start, and he wanted to rush record it, and he wanted to do a B side, and which was Poncho and Lefty, and I've already kind of given it away if he listens to this, but whatever. Um, what was the question? How did I get on that? I'm sorry. How do you determine? What to say yes to, okay. and how do you determine what to say no to? So I said yes to that initially, and this is this is kind of both sides of the coin. Uh, and I got into it, and we were recording it, and there was a part in the the cover that I, of you know when we do in Poncho and Lefty, I was like, man, this just does not sound right. For one, in the back of my mind, I'm going, this song's been done perfectly multiple yeah. times, and there's no reason to do it again. Um, but I was rolling with it, didn't think anything of it, and. I just didn't, it didn't feel right. I couldn't get the vocal right. And I was in the studio, just kind of like getting frustrated a little bit. And so we kind of hit pause. It's like, we can, we'll touch this up another later date. We got to move on because we got another person coming in for this project that this person's doing. And man, it just turned into a, a shit show. And my manager at the time ran into the guy producing it. And he was like, Hey, I just want to hear this track because I haven't heard anything, and and it was we were kind of being left in the dark apparently. And apparently that day when I was questioning the artistic integrity of the choices made for that song, uh, I was pissing off this other artist, and so really? had no idea. And then uh, 
so we got the track. We were listening to it and like, oh, it doesn't sound too bad, you know, whatever. And um, but that guy called me up because he found out and threatened to kick my ass and come to my house on a Sunday night at like eleven o'clock at night. I was like, man, are you on cocaine? What's going on? And so that decided for me that I did not right. want to be. A, and I pulled out that project, but that was a really long story. I probably should yeah, have but no, told, but that's but, interesting though because you had that gut feeling. Like yeah, the whole time. Right. Yep, and and man, so you got to tune into that. Like the next time that comes up. And looking you know? back, I'm like, thank God, that's right. That, uh, I, I didn't do that project because it would be like the only thing people would see on Spotify yeah. and I didn't love the song. It's yeah. just kind of like you, you live and learn, you know? He didn't show up at your house? Oh, no. <laughs> no. Um, and I, you know, I'm, whatever. I've, I, I've, this is the kind of guy I am. I saw him at a show recently and, or, or after that situation and I just was like, hey man, I knew I wasn't in the wrong, but no hard feelings at all. I don't want to like see you around town because we're always mm-hmm. in the same places and, he was just kind of like, he called me up like a few days later and was like, hey, I didn't know how to take that, what you were doing back there, the, the, the thing. I was like. What, being genuine? <laughs> yeah, and, and I, he's like, so if you want to come back in and like finish that song up and we can release it, I'm like, no, you're missing the point, man. Yeah, I'm not yeah. doing it, you know. I just want to be friends, you know. It's like, don't make this breakup harder, man. <laughs> yeah, he just doesn't align, and that's fine. Like, there's going to be people that align. That's all it was, and, yeah. And, and it seems like that's one that doesn't align, but talk about some of those I just wanted to add to that. Yeah, go ahead. The things that can make you upset about the industry, like I was getting to, getting at, is like still to this day he avoids me in public, and so that's a frustrating thing about the industry that is hard to get over for me. It's mm-hmm. like you can't be direct with direct with people. It's it's hard. Yeah. Anyway, it falls into that category of like things you can control and things you can't control. All you can yeah. control is you. Like somebody else's opinion of me is none of my business. Mm-hmm. You know and. And I think it's like that with any industry that we're in, just in, in life in general. But, you know, I, what I was saying was like, there's those people that don't align with us and that's fine. And then there are those people that do align with what we're doing and whether they're mentors or colleagues or even people that may be a ring below, a rung below and, you know, we're seeking advice from you. Talk about some of those mentors. I know you mentioned Brent Cobb earlier. Mm-hmm what those guys do for you help keep you on track whatever it may be like what is it like being around folks like that inspiring uh man it it's so i'll just i'll say my first big mentor that i can name is a guy named aaron hill who made my first record and he's kind of a cosmonaut or something man he's really a he's a space cowboy he kind of like went to this a lot of the same schools i went to in the same area in georgia and uh, same teachers and stuff, but he's like 10 years older than me and has just lived through a lot of the craziness of the music industry, of all sorts of stuff, and he makes records. And so I just started kind of hanging around him, and uh, he's just done a lot of stuff and kind of steered me in the right direction, I would say. It's like, hey, don't say that, you know, or mm-hmm. whatever. And uh, it, it was inspiring to work with somebody who just knew more in the field that I was trying to get into. And same thing with Brent Cobb is that he's had multiple, you know, big cuts with big country artists. He's a, an accomplished artist on his own right. Mm-hmm. And he's just lived through. He's got experience that I don't have. I mean, he's got, he moved here like a decade before me. And uh, there was a lot that, had, that has happened. And a lot of things have changed and different since that time. But you kind of see repeating patterns. And so we were just laughing recently. I was talking with him on the phone and. I said, man, I'm, you know, I'm kind of sitting here. He's like, how you doing? You know, what's going on? And I was like, I'm kind of sitting in that spot where you think nothing's going on in your career and you're just about to quit. And, but you know that it's just right around the corner. And we just laughed yeah. about that because that happens uh, just repeatedly. You're just right about the time you're like through, I'm through with this, uh, yeah. you know, it, it, um, something comes up and it brings you back. But, uh, those mentors, man, they're just, they're everything. Uh, uh, it's kind of the only way you learn anything of any real substance. Well, yeah, it expedites that learning, right? That's, yeah. Speed it up. I'm a big fan of cheat codes in video games. I don't yeah. play video games anymore, but when I was a kid, I was like, cool, yeah. give me all the weapons. The Zelda, yeah, I want to experience this, yeah. <laughs> you may be too young for that way. No, I played Zelda. Did you? Yeah. Yeah, we like I said, we grew up broke, man. So we got like when <laughs> Super NES was coming out, it's like, hey, kids, look, we got you a Nintendo. <laughs> <laughs> saw you saw you watching that commercial. It's like, well, this is the old one, and like, thanks for Duck Hunt, I guess. <laughs> that timeless game, man. Yeah, that's still that game's perfect. Yeah, 
Yeah. All they've done is just elaborate on it in arcades. You know? <laughs> got t-rex versions of it and man do those guys like a brent cobb do they share when you're talking about that like man I'm, I'm just i'm about ready to give up like do they share stories similar like did they go through those same challenges yeah they share some i think so um I, there's some people who like take Coulter for example he won't say shit to you you know <laughs> i love Coulter to death man he, he's but he's kind of like uh you know holds his uh cards close um, even when you ask him um I I don't think I would even ask him, I, you know, personally. But uh, I mean, I, I don't know, man. It's just uh, yeah, I wouldn't ask him. <laughs> um, repeat the question one Fair more time. Enough. Let me. Well, let me no, see. I was just I was just genuinely just curious, um, you know, about those the mentors and do they share some of those stories? Like they hear you talking about, man, it's a grind. You know, I've got this going on and and I'm. I'm my mindset's like I'm thinking about quitting this thing. Yeah. And I know folks out there listening are going to get a lot out of this because no matter what you're pursuing, it, it comes down to your why. Why are you doing it? Mm -hmm. You know, and that, if that passion is strong enough, it's going to push you through those hard times, those hurdles, those challenges. Um, so, but it also helps when you have those people in your corner, those mentors that can be like, wait, listen, dude, like I've been there. Mm -hmm. You've got talent. Keep doing what you're doing. Yep. This is what happened to me, and then they and you kind of you kind of get to hear their success story. It gives you that inspiration or motivation. Totally. To keep going. Um, I haven't met him yet, but Willie Nelson, for example, uh, just this is kind of an extreme of that. Uh, I was reading in, uh, the never Dow, heard of him. The Dow, yeah, I'm sure uh, the Dow of Willie. I was reading, and he talks about uh, laying down in, on Broadway in front of Tootsie's, just waiting for a car to run him over. I mean, that was really the Willie Nelson that we all like look at, like as this guy who's got his act together but mm -hmm. he was at that level and i wasn't far from that i mean i was sleeping in the parking deck down there downtown and like thinking maybe i need to drive up to the top floor and jump off i had those same moments of just like total fear and just like uh just being overwhelmed by the whole thing and so when i read that it was around that same time i read it i, I was like oh okay so if willie made it through i i can make it through you know yeah uh but that's the extreme of that and um i think I'm trying to think of anybody else that has said something to me. You know, I mean, it could be, it's just, a lot of times I get it from interviews like this. You know, I'll, I'll mm -hmm. just hear somebody opening up for the first time outside of the song, mm -hmm. and that helps. I watch a ton of documentaries, listen to podcasts that, yeah. when other writers and artists are, are yeah. doing it. And I think everything is a mentor in a way if you just are right. per perceiving it. Yeah. That Willie example, yeah, you said it was extreme, but that's real. Oh, yeah. You know, it, it's very real and, and, we see we see the highlights we see willie now we don't ever see like the behind the scenes unless it gets brought out in a documentary or somebody opens up about it mm -hmm. you know and so then we try to compare that we're like well we're not there so we must suck mm -hmm. you know we play this comparison game or we get into this imposter syndrome like i don't belong here and again that i know it's uh, i gotta think it's in music but it's across the board just in life it's how humans are wired for whatever reason um, so yeah, I'm, I'm getting long winded, but that's a long way of saying like, yes, mentors are so important. The right mentors. Yeah. You know, that's, that's it. The right mentors. Uh, you kind of want to be open and, you know, to anything that can come your way that might be enlightening in some way. But sometimes I found that those mentors can lead you down paths that might have been a shortcut, but if you miss some of that stuff Something along the way, to through. you're going to have to learn it one way or another, you mm -hmm. know? So I've found that happen at times too, where I trusted somebody and it ended up becoming uh, something that wasn't necessarily something I should put all my eggs into. Yeah. That's the trick. Well, talk about that then. Like, like, a, like a favorite failure of yours. So I'm a firm believer everything in life happen, happens for us and not to us may be woo-woo to a lot of people, but I firmly believe that no matter what happens in my life, it's happening for me. It's the absolute best possible thing that can happen. Mm -hmm. It's all up to me, like how I view it, the lens in which I look through that. So what may be a perceived failure? Do you have like a favorite failure that- I you, can't say I do have a favorite failure. It maybe <laughs> sucked at the time, but it yeah. led to a, a later success. I surely do. I mean, you, do you mean specifically with music or life in general? It can be either. Yeah, either. 
I found like I mean that DUI I got that I mentioned earlier um, that was a major failure I mean I was going 103 and BAC was 0.24 like wasted out of my mind at my wits end and that failure and being vulnerable I went to Elizabeth Cook and talked to her about it and this is me opening up quite a bit of my personal life but um, she in a way took me under her wing and said everybody does stupid shit you know this was a you just gotta not do it anymore that's all it is that's the only trick to the rest of it like you can rebuild from here and so that's probably one of my lowest points in life I had to go spend three days in jail you know and I was just like man don't do don't do this don't do it to your mom don't do it to yourself you know mm-hmm. you're, you're better than this and uh she uh just basically helped me from then on I mean if I hadn't gone through that extreme bad thing um I wouldn't have the, as close of a relationship with her as I do right, right. and I mean, you talk about a, a great mentor. She's been um, just, I mean, it's surreal in a way. You know, like, for example, um, I was house-sitting for her, and there were t- there were squirrels getting in her, like, t- patio tomato plants, and there was a couple of bricks kind of sitting there by the door, and I picked up a brick and chased that squirrel in the yard and threw a brick at it and almost beamed that sucker in the head. <laughs> And uh, so it was on her ring camera or whatever, of course. <laughs> and she was like, telling me the other day, she's like, yeah, I was, or later on, she was like, I was talking with David Letterman the other day and he said to try and cheer him up. So I sent him the video of you throwing a brick at a squirrel. So that's my only interaction with, you know, David Letterman. A little <clears throat> side note there. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah. So that wouldn't have happened. That's, I can say that a great success in my life is, you know, getting a video of me throwing a brick at a squirrel to David Letterman. Yeah. So, yeah, you don't know <laughs> what those things lead to. And that's why I say right. it happens for us. And only time will tell if those are good or bad. Mm-hmm. You know, and even then, we really don't know. We just take them as they come. Without a doubt. And, and it's part of the, the fun of it. Part of the roller coaster. You strap in and go for it. Mm-hmm. I've kind of, in a way, I've, I feel like a, uh, a kite in the wind sometimes. You know, I just kind of like throw myself into this lifestyle and... You know, win, lose, or draw, it's going to be a, a good time. Good reading, anyway. Yeah. Yeah, man, I wish I could do more of that. I wish I could just be that kite in the wind versus trying to be so strict. And There's times I recommend it and times I don't, you know. Yeah. I think there's a, it's a balance. It's a balance, man. It's everything. So in your opinion, Wade, like, what is it that sets those legends apart, the ones, those names, that even if you're not a country music fan, like, you know the name George Strait, you know the name Willie Nelson. Like, what is it that sets those guys apart from the guys that we never heard of? Um, persistence and luck, I think, are the two biggest things. That's just the truth. If you stay busy and stay at it uh, and you're good, um, you know, you'll just, you'll, you'll have something but what sets the legends apart is just persistence i think really i mean if george Strait didn't keep releasing records he would just be you know like a keith whitley or whatever you know when he's kind of lesser known names or big in country music uh and country music audiences but outside of that you don't you don't know about them yeah i think that's all it is i mean um just being good you know that i mean and, and, st- and sticking with what the the changing times uh but also staying in your lane i think helps right. a lot like george Strait kept his sound willie has basically kept his sound reggae record or not it's all willie nelson and he's yeah. him so yeah it, 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 that that question it, it fascinates me and also baffles me like there is no blueprint for it there is no like if you work this hard this is what's going to happen this is going to be the result and so mm-hmm. I've got to think that most of those guys, you included, like doing this thing full time, everybody's working hard. Right? Yeah. Like that's a given. You're going to work hard. Yeah. It, whether you're a musician or a horse trainer, or a businessman, w- businesswoman, whatever it is, what is it that separates? Like, is it God given? Is it timing? Is it, like you said, luck? All those. I mean, um, I like to think some of it's God given because I, I've been pretty lucky in ways that I can't really um, explain. Like just the the experiences I've had have been just insane for somebody who doesn't even have a record out. Mm-hmm. Um, for like, 
I never thought I would be sitting at Johnny and June's dinner table in their vacation home in Jamaica with Chris Christopherson across the table and I'm handing him hot sauce. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> that happened. <laughs> what? You know, like, it, but I, I trusted the that mentor, like like Elizabeth Cook, and she took me on the Outwall cruise and I played guitar and stuff and that was one of the excursions that they kind of did and filmed it and whatever, but mind-blowing. That's awesome, man. Yeah. So, to segue off of that, like, what would you say your metric for success is? Um... I consider this moment a measure of success. Uh, I'm in Nashville, Tennessee, talking with you, and there are cameras and microphones. I think this is something that I just kind of had that moment uh, about five minutes into this of just kind of like, whoa, that's happening. Like, you're no longer playing. You know, I guess talking about my old gigs and stuff brought it up, but um, just anything that feels like I'm being appreciated for what the work I've done uh, is a measure of su success, I think. Mm -hmm. And this feels like appreciation in a way. Yeah. Man, I love that answer. I love that answer because a lot of times we go to money right away, you know, like that, mm -hmm. which is far from the truth for me, maybe for somebody else. Oh, man, I mean. Far from the truth for me. I think if I had money, I'd, just, I'd still be broke. It would just look different. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? I would spend it all. Like I've said forever, I'm going to have a dirt track. If I end up with, like, Garth Brooks money, I'm going to put a dirt track and, like, eight beaters out there and just, like, take my buddies out and... See if they can beat my time. Yeah. You know? <laughs> well, I think that's what money does. I, I get to be a NASCAR driver, man. <laughs> it just magnifies who you are, right? I think yeah. that's all more money does. It magnifies who you are. That's a good point. Definitely a good point. Um, okay, I'll shift gears with you, Wade. And okay. We'll, and we'll go into a little different segment. This one's brought to you by Ghostwood Distilling Company. And this is going, these are going to be a little bit lighter. Um, but if you could go back in time to any time period and live for one week, when would that be? The country music fan in me wants to say the 70s because that was like, that's my largest point of inspiration, just to hang around here with like, we're at Sound Emporium right now. You know, this is a legendary house of recording here. And if I was here back then, just to fly on the wall to see some of the stuff that was done here, man, yeah. that would blow my mind. Uh, I think it, part of me also would love to be like in the, uh, you know, the before civilization really kind of changed things in this country i would love to have been here uh to see you know america and it's untouched yeah uh when it wasn't called america you know and um uh, just be a part of that i love nature man and i just i love uh purity in general you know it's rare very rare right i filter my water but I, i'm sure there's still some metals in there and stuff <laughs> but uh <laughs> Anyway, man, it's it, that's that's where I would go is just to see untouched nature. It's mm -hmm. one of my favorite things, and it's, it doesn't really exist anymore unless you even in Antarctica. You know, people hike to the South Pole. Yeah, like what? Yeah, come on, you can't go anywhere anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Here's another question about nature: um, When you're in a public restroom and somebody knocks on the door, what is your response? That's a, I was trying to think of something funny to say. It didn't work. Uh, somebody's in here. That's that's what I would say. I don't know why that question is so funny to me, dude. Any time, any answer I get like makes me laugh. Yeah, yeah. I just say hey, somebody's in here. I think is my go-to. It's something that we all do, but nobody ever really talks about. Yeah. You know? Somebody's in. I here. just scream very loudly. <laughs> that's what happens. I heard somebody say, "Come in." Yeah. Come in. And then they question whether they lock. It's the door. unlocked. Yeah. All right. What's the best investment you made in the last six months under a hundred dollars? I bought a uh, Lufkin measuring wheel for checking square footage of long areas or distance, and that's that's my best investment because it takes the guesswork out of jobs I do. Yeah. Yeah. Right on. Um, what is the and you got to be honest, Wade? What is the last thing you Googled? The last thing I Googled was driving and crying. It's a rock band from Atlanta, Georgia. Right on. I just wanted to see what the Wikipedia said on them, and it said they were an American Southern rock band. Their band, their their pit band page says that they are a folk rock band, which I think is more accurate. But anyway, that's the last thing I googled. Sweet. Um, are you a save for a rainy day or spend it while you got it kind of guy? Probably a spend it while I got it because I ain't usually got a lot, and I got it just goes right back out. Uh, honestly. Fair enough. I don't really. I don't have kids. I don't think i'll have kids so you know my, my goal as far as 
financial gain goes uh, is I just don't want my mom to work anymore. And I want that to be on, like, if she's got retirement money, I want her to spend it on herself, you know. Uh, but I want to put set her up. Yeah, good for you. What's a song that you wish you wrote? Lost Highway, maybe. I mean, it was a Leon Payne song. Hank took, I mean, that's just like a, I kind of heard that song for the first time and knew it was what I was going to find myself on, mm-hmm. even going to church and everything. I just yeah. kind of like, it felt like somebody singing my story. Right on. Right on. Um, favorite cartoon as a kid? Uh, King of the Hill, maybe. <laughs> I, I, that's probably my, that's the one I've seen like every episode of. Damn it, Bobby. Yeah, exactly. It's a great one, man. There's a lot of great life lessons. It might be like crass at times. It's just more raw and real mm-hmm. than the typical sitcom style show. Oh, yeah. You know? Yeah. And um, yeah, they've got life lessons all through it. All through it. Are you a reader? Do you read books? Not as much as I should, no. Okay. A screensaver on your phone. Uh, it's a picture of my girlfriend. Right on. And well, that's on the lock screen. If you swipe it, then it's just like this kind of Alex Gray looking artwork of like the human body with all kinds of weird connections all around it and energy field. So you sing like a cowboy. You look like a cowboy. How would you define that style? Um, it, I think it comes from like the reason I, I started wearing a cowboy hat was because ball caps just looked a little beaver cleaver, you know, just kind of. Especially short hair, too. I got long hair. I know I kind of look like a freak at Kroger, but um, <laughs> it's the truth, man. People are like, Ugh. especially like the all black. I just kind of yeah. like, I find things that seem to work and I and really identify with what uh, it is that I say. And um, the cowboy thing, my dad rode bareback. Um, that Florida is a place that a lot of people don't realize is a huge cowboy mm-hmm. culture through the middle of that state. Uh, anybody who works with cows knows that, but... Mm-hmm. Um, I, it's, I'm kind of co-op in that culture, to be honest with you. It helps me to, um, it helps to set me, my, me apart from the bro country, if you will, or mm-hmm. just the more kind of urban style of country music that happens um, so often nowadays as, as the mainstream. Um, I like the style. I'm like 5'8". Cowboy boots help lift me up a little bit. Right um, and plus, I worked at a Western store for years, and just the, coming from that kind of, you know, all, it doesn't matter if you're a cowboy or not. In Florida, you probably got a cowboy hat on, a straw hat, yeah. you know, in the summertime. And uh, that's all, that's where it comes from. And right on. it's kind of putting up a front, totally. I mean, I'll be the first to say it, but I like the way it looks, man. That's, that's all it is. <laughs> I mean, I wear the same shirt every show, same jeans every show. I mean, it's just kind of like cartoon character, you know? I dig it, man. I, I dig I don't think it's what you wear. It's how you wear it. Um, okay, last question, my friend. If you could have a billboard, um, metaphorically speaking, to get a message out to millions of people, mm-hmm. what does your message say? Maybe just, I mean, this. if I could say one thing, it'd probably be everybody's doing the best they can, which is a nice way of saying don't be a dick. Everybody's doing the best they can. If that was on a billboard, I think it would make people maybe kind of ease off that gas a little bit. Yeah, I love it. I love it, my friend. Well, what do you think? You want to play one to close us out? Oh, yeah. Let me grab my guitar. All righty, my friend. What do you got for us today? Well, I kind of talked about um, homelessness for a minute and living in my van, you know. um, I wrote a song about it recently, and this isn't recorded anywhere or anything, so I just figured I'll play that one and see see how it goes. It's called Sleeping Under the Stars. had a wild imagination The great outdoors framed my childhood And we'd load the van for a poor man's vacation And camp all weekend in the woods They were simple times but we sure had I was just a kid, but I still understood Sleeping under stars Shows you who you are Heaven ain't that far When the I know what he 
lying about underneath the stars. So I grew up, moved to Music City, where concrete covers up the sky. Honky tonks took all of my pennies. So I camped in my car a lot of nights in a parking deck below the walk of fame. I dreamed that would one day be my name. I'm still working it out. You no, know. I felt that one. You can learn a lot. You go spend some time under the stars. That's right. You can learn a whole. No doubt. That uh, coyote lyric in there. That's kind of like a nickname for me back home. Uh, it's coyote. People kind of call me that. Cause I was pretty wild. Wade was kind of the thing, but it 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 turned into coyote. The preacher thing kind of ruined that, didn't it? Oh yeah, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> yeah, and so yeah, that's where that line comes from. I love it, man. It's a beautiful song. Thanks, man. Beautiful song. Um, well, dude, thanks for coming by, man. I really enjoyed it. I did, too. Thoroughly enjoyed it. Thanks um, for having let, me. Before you go, though, let folks know what, what do you have coming up, where they can find you if they want to listen to more music. I would say look for an album in, like, late spring of 2022. That's definitely happening. Um, Sweet. I've got a lot of recorded music, and it's finally you know, getting compiled into something that can be, you know, available for everybody to hear. Right and, on. There'll be tours with all that stuff. In the meantime, the best thing to do is just follow me on social media, and I'm sure you'll link all that stuff or what yeah, have you. We but can put it in the show notes. Yeah, um, you're and also it, going on the Outlaw Cruise again next year, right? Yep, that's right. It's in in February, um, and that's uh, just full of good stuff like Rodney Crowell, Carlene Carter, Elizabeth Cook, of course. We talked about she's yeah. going to be on there, and um, Steve Earle. Steve Earle, yeah. It's just you know a lot of that outlaw country crowd. You know, yeah. it's 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 just kind of amazing that that's even happening. And yeah, um, yeah, the outlaw cruise. And I've been talking with like I just played a show here in town with a guy named Cody West out of Texas, and um, that's I think going to turn into a lot more shows in you know Texas and out Sweet. west. So I'll be out there a good bit next year. So right on, man. Yeah, man. Well, best of luck in, in the future, man. Thanks, Continue Mike. Continued success. Appreciate yes, it, sir. man. Good to meet you. You bet.